welcome to our information session for the Masters in Medical Laboratory Science Leadership Program for our upcoming semester, which is the summer 2023 semester. Um, just a couple housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, the meeting is being recorded. Um, you are joining this webinar. Um, your video function and your microphone function, that has been disabled but we do encourage you to use the question and answer feature within Zoom. If you do have any questions that we can help with throughout the presentation, we will have some dedicated time at the end to answer all the questions. So we will have that Q&A at the end, but as we're going through the presentation, we encourage you to post the questions that you have um, you know, as we go along. All right, so as I mentioned, um, we're, we're very excited to be talking about our online Masters of Science in Medical Laboratory Science Leadership Program. Um, we have with us today our program director, Dr. Pat Tilley. Um, she will be giving us information on the program and sharing her insight on some of these topics. Uh, my name is Abby Sparks. I am one of our enrollment services advisors for our online master's in medical laboratory science leadership program. Uh, some of you may already be working with me um, or one of my team members as well. We are here to answer any questions that you have and provide guidance and support um, throughout learning about the program as well as the application process. Uh, with us here today, we also have one of our associate professors, Stephanie Jacobson, as well as our program manager, Courtney Gutierrez. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our program director, Dr. Tilly. Thanks, Abby. So as Abby said, I am the program director of the Masters in Medical Lab Science Leadership at the University of Cincinnati. Um, I'm actually a professor at the university as well. I've been with the university now for about five years, but I have about three decades of experience in higher education as well as molecular microbiology from bench to specialist to supervisor uh, to manager. So I have quite an array of experience. So let me talk a little bit about the Masters of Science and Leadership program at UC. I think one of the things that I really enjoy about the program and working with students is it allows you to customize the fit of the program to fit your career goals. So we have different concentrations, and I'll talk about them a little bit more a little bit later, but we have healthcare management, higher education, and two advanced practice pathways that I will talk about. You also have the opportunity once you have a master's degree is to obtain a specialist certification in any of the concentration areas that ASCP has, like the specialist in micro, the specialist in blood bank, the specialist in molecular. And depending on the specialist, for some reason, they aren't consistent. Some of them say route two, some of them say route three. Of course, that does go along with appropriate work experience in that area. And we don't obviously make that judgment that's ASCP. But once you have the master's degree and you have the related experience, you're eligible for those certification routes. Um, all of our instructors are terminally degreed faculty. I have a PhD in biomedical health science. I'm actually a molecular microbiologist. Uh, Dr. Jacobson is a doctorate of clinical lab science, and we have other medical doctors as well as PhDs um, in micro and other areas that also teach as adjuncts in some of our courses. The information, I don't think this is new to anybody if you're on here, we know that there's a lot of earnings and career opportunities. We know jobs are growing. We also know the workforce is struggling right now, but it's a great uh, time to be able to move and have new opportunities in the field of laboratory science. Go ahead, Abby. So it is 100% online. You never have to come to campus. And in fact, myself and Dr. Jacobson are both remote. 
Um, we do not work in Ohio, so we are remote just like many of you would be. The program is a 30 credit hour master's, so you actually complete your degree in five terms. So we go year round. So um, depending on what term you start, because we have rolling admission, which means you can start in any academic term, you go for five terms, which actually comes out to about 18 months. Um, as long, again, as long as you stay on track, you know, not everybody does it that fast. Some people break it up a little bit, um, but if you start and go start to finish, that's how long the degree takes. We have a core that teaches you leadership skills. That's one of the areas when we talk to administrators in a traditional bachelor's degree program, whether you're in medical lab science, histotechnology, biology, molecular, you don't get a lot of experience with what we consider soft skills. So how to work with people and things like critical conversations, how to manage situations, what kind of skill sets make you a good leader? Um, what kind of leader do you wanna be? We all work with different individuals and we know that different people we work with have different styles. But we've learned about how those styles fit together and when to use them and, and how they fit. And, and we apply that to laboratory situations and troubleshooting. And we cover, again, across education, management, and other areas. So not just our regular traditional laboratory. The other thing I think that's very positive about the program is that our students come from everywhere, just like our faculty are remote, um, but you get connected with a network of professionals from all over the country. I've had students from Alaska to Hawaii, to California, to Florida. Um, right now we have a student that is um, an American that happens to be stationed in Turkey that is working in our program. So obviously that individual is not in any of our time zones. So uh, it's a program that is flexible and literally you can connect with individuals in the field all over the United States and even outside of the United States. So that's a great opportunity, I think, for everyone. So here's what the curriculum looks like. There are six core courses. Those are what we call the foundation of the program that everybody takes. Those are the courses that are what I call the core. So they do contain leadership theory, interprofessional collaboration, evidence-based practice. There's some ethics in there. There's management, quality management, um, professional development. So that's kind of your leadership core part. It does, again, bridge management and education and, and advanced practice. So it blends all those together. And then what you do is you pick an area of concentration. Now, the area of concentration, there's technically four. There's healthcare management administration. And I will tell you in that track, there was a huge variety of classes to choose from. You can choose anything from policy and regulations in healthcare to organizational management, to public health. There's some public health courses in there, um, some culture and equity and health disparity classes. So even though it's healthcare management and, and administration, you have the ability to tailor within that concentration based on your strengths or your interests. The higher education is also similar. The higher education there's a variety of courses from working in a community college to instructional design to online learning. Um, so again, a little bit different focus as to depending on what your interest is as far as higher education. And then the two advanced practice tracks, we have advanced practice in immunohematology and transfusion medicine and advanced practice in molecular diagnostics. Now, the first one is really designed to cover the content that would be applicable to a specialist in blood bank. And the second one covers pretty much the content that would be applicable to a specialist in molecular biology or molecular diagnostics. 
Um, those are the two concentration areas that do require a specific order of classes. In other words, when you start the advanced practice immunohematology, you can't jump into those in any direction. They would be a course where you need to take the first class as a prerequisite to the second, to the third, because of the content. And the same way with the molecular. All of the other courses do not have prerequisites like that. And then finally, you end up in the capstone, which is the culminating course where you develop a project in your concentration. Now, this is it's not a thesis. It's not a dissertation. It does not have to be a hands-on research project. It is generally a topic of interest that is related to your concentration. And throughout the program, Dr. Jacobson and I work through you with the core classes as well as some of the concentration classes. And one of the things that we do is in those classes, we ask you to consider what in that class might have been a topic that you would be interested in developing further so that when you arrive in the capstone, you're not in that situation where you think, oh my goodness, this is a capstone. What am I going to do now to finish this up? So our students uh, do a variety of projects. It, again, it depends on where they're at. Um, they investigate hot topics in molecular diagnostics, uh, blood product usage. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and topics where students have addressed harmonization of lab results or developing a new quality management program at their facility. So we also work with the students to find out if there's something that they're working on in their current position that we could apply to this so that you can use your time very efficiently. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. And I think that's important to understand because I think when people look at capstone course, we, when we have these virtual, we get a lot of questions about that. Go ahead, Abby. And then obviously you want some return on your investment. And when we talk to our students, most of them are in the program to move themselves up in their professional position or advance themselves. Um, and the evidence does show that the more specialized training you have and the higher you move up, your salary generally goes up. Now we also know, and, and some of you, um, you can look at this data. ASCP doesn't publish their data too fast, but salaries vary based on geography. So you got to understand that these are median values and they do different uh, values based on where you're at. They also differ based on your titles. And unfortunately, in laboratory, our titles aren't always consistent. So that's something to keep in mind. But we do have many, many students that from the program uh, they are in the process of seeking management, seeking directors, and once they obtain their degree, they, they are appointed in those positions. We've had several students appointed as regional lab directors and managers and, and even moving into different areas. We've recently had students moving on a clinical diagnostics into the world of cannabis testing and development of those labs because that's a very big thing nationwide. So a lot of diversity in, in the group. Um, job titles and functions, I've mentioned a couple. We've had histology, people move into histology supervisor positions. I've mentioned directors, managers, individuals in education. Um, that are either moving into education as instructors. Sometimes they're already an adjunct. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're moving into full-time positions, uh, program directors in educational programs. And in education, you are required to have one degree higher than the level you teach at. So in order to teach in a bachelor's program, the Higher Learning Commission requires that you have a master's. In order to teach in a master's, the Higher Learning Commission requires that you have a doctorate degree. So moving up from an associate program to a BS level program, we have individuals doing that as well as individuals that will go on and obtain higher degrees. 
technical specialists and technical supervisors are also those kind of things. So we see a lot of that and um, many of our students have great success doing that. Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Gutierrez. I'm the program manager from the program. Um, I've been with UC for 15 years and I've worked with both the bachelor's program and the master's program. And I was looking at the list of participants and I actually recognized some names um, from the bachelor's program. So I guess welcome back and thanks for showing interest in the master's program. Um, to get everyone kind of up to speed, I know some of you have already applied. Um, but I'll go over the admission requirements for those who have not and who are still considering. Um, so first things first, um, if you are applying to the program, you do need to have a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited institution with a minimum of a 3.0. Um, that when you do submit your transcripts, they do not need to be official transcripts. They can be unofficial. But once you are accepted and start the program, they need to be um, in with the grad school before you actually start courses. Um, you also need a certification um, or a type of employment documentation to show that you've been working in the lab um, for two years if you are not certified. Um, but if you are certified, go ahead and upload either your ASCP, AMT, um, or even your state licensures for your application process. Um, I did speak about transcripts. So again, those can be unofficial, but eventually we will need officials. Two letters of recommendation. Um, one needs to be from a supervisor. Your resume, a personal statement, um, and that personal statement should really touch upon um, your leadership skills, um, how you will do well in a master's program, your career goals, um, what personal attributes you have that would um, help you along with um, getting your master's degree. Um, so be sure to address those items. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more um, as to why on the next slide. Um, and for this, for just attending the session today, um, and really for all summer 2022 applicants, the application fee is waived. Okay, so I spoke briefly about um, the personal statement. And the reason that is important is for two scholarship opportunities right off the bat. Um, when you apply to the program, your application will also get reviewed for two possible scholarships. The first one being anyone who has a bachelor's degree from UC will automatically be awarded a thousand dollar scholarship just right off the bat. It's one of our recruiting tools um, to create that bridge between our bachelor's program and our master's program. So if you are a UC graduate um, from a bachelor's program, you will have that scholarship available to you. The other scholarship that um, we consider for all applicants is the um, CAS College of Allied Health Science Recruiting Scholarship. That one is, again, for $1,000. That one has a little bit more stipulations, and we can award anywhere from one to two applicants that scholarship. Um, for that scholarship, your GPA needs to be a 3.5 or higher. And your personal statement, as well as your resume, should address any type of leadership roles that you have within your professional organization. Um, so be sure that you are addressing those in your application. For those two specific scholarships, just your application to the program is enough. You don't need to take an additional step. For the next one listed down here that says available for second year students, this one's a separate application process. Um, and really, this isn't one that I'm going to go too in depth just because it's not available to our students until they are in their second year. But know that if you do consider our program, this is something that is available to you down the line. Um, this one is $1,000. And it's available to students who will demonstrate leadership skills within, again, their community, professional organization, that sort of thing. Um, there will be an application going out usually in July, so that way it can be awarded in the fall. Um, and that will have a separate application process and due date along with it. Um, one other scholarship related opportunity I did want to jump in and mention is that we also have a program called our University to Business Scholarship, um, and that's something that I definitely encourage you to talk to your enrollment services advisor about. What that opportunity is, is um, the University of Cincinnati 
um, we can potentially partner with your employer. Um, and then in return, you can get a scholarship um, kind of based off of that partnership. So um, again, that's something that if you think that your um, employer might be interested in um, having that partnership, it's at no cost to them. Um, and we can definitely talk about getting that um, communication going um, for that university to business opportunity as well. And Abby, I just wanted to mention one quick thing too that made me think about that is, and I'm not sure if anybody on here is eligible, but we are also approved by the veteran the fair system um, for military individuals and tuition reimbursement. So that's also another important benefit uh, for candidates that have that option. Yes, thank you. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about what it's like to be a student at the University of Cincinnati for our online programs. Um, so first of all, I think it's important to mention that you will have support from you know, the moment you're requesting information to working on your application, um, all the way through enrollment, throughout your program, through graduation as well. Um, so every student is going to be partnered with what we call a student success coordinator, and they are going to be your individual support system throughout the program. So they are going to be in communication with you to make sure that you're getting enrolled for the right courses. You know, they'll be there to answer any questions. Um, you know, they're, they're knowledgeable on the program, and they're also there to help and support you in any way possible as well. So you will have your student success coordinator working with you one-on-one -on -one throughout the program. Um, another awesome thing is that, you know, even though it's an online um, master's degree, we do try and give it that on-campus feel and that you will have access to basically all the resources that a on-campus student, student would have. So for example, you'll have access to the library and all of the resources that come with that. You'll have technical support if you ever need that, as well as online learning management help. Um, the platform that we use for our online program is Canvas, and we will have support if you ever need technical support with that platform. You'll also have access to um, some um, other opportunities like using the Writing Center. I know there's also tutoring services available. So all of those things that one might normally have access to with a traditional on-campus program, we have that available to you as well in the online version. And then lastly, I know Dr. Tilly touched on this a little at the beginning with really just having that opportunity to be able to network, um, not only with the faculty, um, who is well connected, but your peers as well. Um, again, it's an online program, but you'll have opportunities to where you'll be able to interact with your other um, peers. The classes are asynchronous, so you'll be able to work on the material at your own time, but you'll also have those opportunities to connect, whether it's with your professors or with your peers. Um, and again, we're all here to, to help you um, make sure you're set up for success. Um, to, you know, achieve your, your goals in the program. So let's talk about the next steps. Um, if you are not already talking with your enrollment services advisor, again, I highly recommend um, getting connected with them. Like I said, we are here to help answer any questions that you might have about the program details and support you throughout the application process as well. So you can visit our online web or the online UC website there to request information or continue to work on your application or get one started. Um, the deadline to complete an application for our upcoming summer semester is going to be April 12th. Um, and we do want to mention as well that there is a mandatory orientation that's very important for this program. And that is going to be April 24th through May 5th. So that's just, you know, some other dates to definitely keep in mind um, that that will be an upcoming mandatory orientation for accepted students. Uh, actual classes for the program for the summer semester would then begin May 8th. And again, we are currently waiving that application fee for those who apply for our upcoming summer term. 
So you're welcome to get an application started and submitted at no cost to you there. Okay, so um, with that, there is a QR code here if you are interested in jumping right in and getting an application started. Other than that, we will open it up for some Q&A. So if you have any questions at all about the program or any of the content that we covered here um, or the application process that we can help with, feel free to post those questions in the question and answer feature, and then we can answer them for you. Um, so I know that it looks like while we wait for some additional questions to come through, I know um, Dr. Tilly, you mentioned how the curriculum can be flexible in that um, you can kind of customize it based off of which track you wanted to do. Is there maybe one that um, is maybe a popular route that people do or maybe one that, um, that you would recommend um, for a, a popular choice students take? Well, I can tell you, and, and there's a little more customization to it than kind of what it demonstrates the way I laid it out. The one thing is you can also do is you can customize across those tracks. And for instance, we had an individual that took the first molecular course that was all the applications and analysis, the technical areas, and took the first class in the transfusion medicine track and then took an education course. Um, we have students that will take two of the management courses and then maybe an education course. So there is nothing that stops you from taking courses across those areas if that's your interest. And that's just part of the advising that I go through when I talk with students. Now, one of the things that we do ask when students go through the orientation is we do ask that you tell us which concentration you intend on taking, just so that we have a, a stepping point to have those conversations. Um, you're not locked into that. It's just to give us an idea because we also, over time, it's for advising, but we also plan for you know, how many students are gonna be in different concentrations and those things. So that's important to know. Um, there is some flexibility there. And since I'm talking about classes, I can see Jenna's first question. The classes are asynchronous, which means they're open all the time. Very rarely do you have to be in a live class all at the same time. Now, there are some rare instances where that does happen. For instance, there is a, well, it's an interprofessional activity in the spring. And there's two evenings where the students interact with other graduate students from other areas. And if it becomes a difficult thing, we do offer an asynchronous recording. So even if we do have synchronous requirements, we generally record those and make those available for people that have reasonable um, reasons to not be there. Because we know that with the different time zones and work schedules, some people are on evenings, some people are on days. We don't require that. I will tell you that faculty have office hours. We try to have office hours during the day and in the evening on different days of the week so that you're able to meet with us live if you need assistance. And if for some reason you can't do that, we generally offer opportunities to schedule meetings with you. So our faculty are very committed and we understand that. Uh, time limit of years, we do not. And you can, so some, if you can finish the program in 18 months. We've been asked multiple times if you could take it part time. So the degree is actually part time as it is. In other words, you take two classes, one term, and our classes are modular. So what happens is if you start in the summer, you'll take two classes, but one class is the first seven weeks and the second class is the second seven weeks. And so you're, you're rarely taking two classes at one time. Now that doesn't hold true when you get into some of the other concentrations, like some of the education classes and some of the management classes are full semester. And so then you may be taking one class in the first seven weeks and the other class runs the whole term. 
But those are things that when you look at classes, we can look at and decide if that's a good option for you. Um, but there is no time or years limit from the standpoint of our program. The capstone, it is an individual project, Linda. It is not a group project. <laughs> Does a 2.976 GPA round up to a 3.0? It, it most certainly can. If you aren't exactly at a 3.0, I would still put in my application because we do a holistic admissions process. So GPA is a factor, but we also look at your work experience uh, and your personal statement. And so we are allowed to make holistic decisions like that. The graduate school at the university requires a 3.0, but they do allow us to make admissions with justification. So. Yeah, if you do not have a 3.0, I would still encourage you to apply because your application will be considered with the other information that you provide. I think these are just all for me. <laughs> <laughs> How is the program more beneficial compared to an MHA master's in health administration? Um, we do have finance and budgeting in our curriculum. Uh, we talk about different budget models in one of our leadership courses. It's We literally go through different budget models and how those are managed and direct costs and indirect costs and, and those kind of things uh, as far as um, for management and administration, because it is an important factor. Um, it is not the entire thing that you need to be a manager because just because you learn budgets and, and administrative tasks, leadership is a big thing. And, and there's a lot of theory with dealing with personnel and competency assessments and regulations and those kind of things. So it, it is in there. Um, again, depending on some of those other healthcare administration courses that you would choose to put in there, that complement where we go through leadership management, quality management, you can add in other avenues that would strengthen it as well that are beyond actually an MHA program. Some of our courses in our administration concentration are actually taught by the healthcare administration. Um, we have actually also had students double major across Health administration and MLS leadership because we can accept, I think it's up to nine credits, so three courses. So we have had students double major in both because the MHA program is more broad and our program strictly focuses on skill sets and management directly to laboratory practice, not just health administration in the broad context. Can I get an, e um, do you want to post an email, Abby, in the? Yeah, I, I saw that question for Dara. for Dara. Dara, I will definitely, I can connect with you one off to, to answer any of those questions that you have. Um, and we can definitely work with you on that. And Abby, do you know, I don't have tuition information. That's not in my wheelhouse. Yeah, um, I, I can take that one. So tuition, um, it is per credit hour. Um, and because we are an online program, there's not a huge difference when it comes to in-state versus out-of-state tuition. So in-state tuition is going to be $754 per credit hour. Out-of-state tuition is going to be $769 per credit hour. So when talking about the program in full with the 30 credit hours, for in-state, total cost is going to be around $22,620, where out-of-state is going to be about $23,000. Um, yeah. And uh, with that, too, I will mention, um, I know we do accept um, financial aid, as well as different payment plans for, you know, tuition that students might have to pay out of pocket. So there are different options when it comes to 
um, you know, planning financially for the program, whether that's thinking about the scholarships that are available, um, going the financial aid route, or exploring one of our payment plans that we have as well. Yeah, and I don't know if you go out to our website or the Facebook page too, um, we have, we do have some testimonials out there from our graduate. And I would have to say that the nice thing about it is we do realize that you're working professionals. So the program is geared for individuals that are working professionals, which is why the MLS core is modular, where you're only focusing on one class at a time, because it's, I think it's easier to focus on one class, maybe with a little more work in that one class than juggling two courses at the same time where your brain has to jump between things. It helps you stay organized. All of our classes in our MLS courses are structured similarly in, in the context of how they look when you get in the learning management system. And that's part of what orientation does. So orientation is there because there's some policies and forms and things we go through, but it really is there to give you a feel for what the Canvas system looks like, how to navigate the system and get a little bit comfortable with it before you jump into a course um, right away. So that, that orientation is very important, not only for program policies and understanding program specific information, but being comfortable and kind of seeing how it flows, how to get into office hours, how to reach out and talk to each other, how to talk and interact with your faculty. And I will be totally honest with you, the students that I've met personally uh, at graduation or in other professional venues, when a student walks up to you after you've been working with them in the online environment, it's not any different than working with a student in the classroom. Um, honestly, there's as much understanding and relationship there as in the classroom because we do have, we have one-on-one -on -one conversations just like we are now, only they have their cameras on too. And they might be sitting in their kitchen or their living room and their cat runs behind them or their dog runs behind them or you have small kids that come up and wave. And, and that's okay, that's acceptable. I have some grandchildren, in fact, they're out in the other room right now that will pop in and they wanna see who's on my computer. So understand that being in that flexible environment, it, it's acceptable. Some people may be at work, once in a while we got somebody that hops on on their break, uh, they're in the break room. I swear to gosh that somebody was in a supply closet one day. Um, the students will go out to their car on break and hop online with me if yes, that happens to be the environment they're in. So we're very much used to that. We're um, flexible with that. We realize that that happens. We also realize that because we're in different areas of the country that things happen like ice storms and you're going to lose power and internet floods and you know, the horrible weather in California right now. And when we have tornadoes and hurricanes and, you know, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that because I live in the area of the country where we have tornadoes. So we realize those things happen. And generally we kind of know where our students are from, from being in contact with them all the time. So we make adjustments for that. The key, the key to the whole thing is communicate with your faculty and instructors, um, and we work with you through any of those kinds of disasters and, and personal challenges and those kind of things. We're very much understanding of how those things affect our daily lives, and, and you're busy when you're working professional and you have family. Awesome. Well, I believe that's all the questions that we have out there for now. Um, I want to mention again, if anyone does have any additional questions or they did want to talk to someone one off, um, your enrollment services advisor is there to help with any of those questions. Um, and again, you can scan this QR code here to get that information and um, get your application started.
Um, but we want to thank you all for taking some time out of your evening to um, talk about the program with us. Hopefully, um, you've, you've taken away some good information here and are ready to get started. So thank you all again, and uh, everyone have a great rest of their evening.